Well, can I start by saying good evening to everyone who's watching, um, and thanks for coming along and listening to the to the panel tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, yeah poetry of identity, identity poetry. But knowing the three of us, um, we're going to cycle around it in elliptical ways, and we might not provide you with straightforward answers or sound bites. So forgiveness, please, um, if that's what you were after. Um, Malika, uh, you can see, is chairing the discussion tonight. So if I briefly say, well, we all know who Malika Booker is. Malika is one of the path blazers for black British poetry in the last um, in the last 15 and 20 years. Um, I, I'm privileged to be a member of the Malika's Poetry Kitchen, which she and Roger Robinson set up and is still going strong to this day. Um, uh, Malika, you're currently at Manchester Metropolitan University teaching poetry and creative writing. That's right. Yes, yes, I am. Yes, yes, yes I am. And, yes. uh, and, and I can report that new work is forthcoming as well. And I've seen some early drafts and it is mighty and fabulous. So yeah, you are in for a treat when it emerges, people. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. I am so privileged to be here with Rishi and Dan. And Dan, who is Dan? I'm so pleased to be here with Rishi and Will. I'm renaming, I'm, re I'm giving Will a whole new identity already. Um, so I... <laughs> <laughs> Dan. So um, Rishi is like a, a tour de force um, in, 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 the, in the industry. Um, he's based in London. His poems have appeared in the Financial Times. Um, he's a poet, but also he is, um, he works as a consultancy editor at the Rialto magazine. He also works in um, advertising. His first full collection, Ticker Tape was released by Nine Arches in 2017. And his Tour de Force um, collection, Saffron Jack, which I want us to hopefully talk about, um, has recently come out to really profound reviews. I think um, Daljit Nagra says, nobody writes the way Rishi does. Um, and then I'm proud to share the space with Will Harris as well. Um, Will is also a contributing editor at Rialto and all three of us are fellow Complete Works um, alumni. Um, he is, um, his poems say was shortlisted for the Ford Prize for Best Single Poetry in 2018. And he's received the Poetry Fellowship from the Arts Con Foundation in 2019. He co-edited the spring 2020 issue of the Poetry Review with Mary Jean Chang and his book, Rendang, is, has come out to um, acclaim. And um, he shortlisted, it was a Poetry Book Society choice and shortlisted for the Ford Prize for Best Collection. Um, I wanted to start by just saying in a way that we are kin. There's a lot of that, that one of our identities that we're a family of poets. Um, and I wanted to talk about that notion of family, first of all, because everybody knows I'm all about community. But in a way, we have so much kinship. All three of us are alumni of the complete works. We all have seminal essays in the legendary anthology, The Craft, The Guide to Making Poetry Happen in the 21st Century edited by our own Rishi. So if you haven't got that, your bookstep is, is bereft. Um, and as you know, Will and I are both shortlisted for the Forward Prize um, this year. And Will and Rishi are both editors of Rialto and Rishi and I are both members of Malika's Poetry Kitchen. So there's all these kind of, um, uh, I suppose, overlaps and, and all these kind of familial kind of relationships. I wanted to start really with the poet Audre Lorde. Um, Audre Lorde said, if I didn't define myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive during a speech at Harvard University in 1982. Um, she's a poet, essayist, and novelist, if you don't know who she is. But what I'm struck by, she always started her performance owning her litany of identities. Um, she would state, my name is Audre Lorde, and I'm a black lesbian mother warrior poet. Um, and I wanted to start us off there, actually, because I think, in a way, if we're going to be talking about identity um, as, as, as poets, I think when we sit down to write in our room, um, we don't think, I'm writing an identity poem. We don't, that, that term doesn't come into effect. So I, I suppose I wanted us to talk about the, the names, that, the, the, the identities that we kind of shape, shift between, um, that we navigate and we give ourselves, and then the identities that other people give us. I thought that would be a good place to start. Um, 
and I'm just kicking it out to you. Also, this is a conversation, so um, there's not a script as such. That's my scripted bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Will and Rishi, jump in. If you have questions for me, we'll just take it that way. I'm, I'm really struck by that, actually, and I didn't know that about um, Audrey Lord. Um, because that, I, I, can, I can imagine almost that being a very defiant act at the start of a reading or a gig, but also potentially a limiting one as well, um, in the sense of, in the sense of, okay, I've, here is my stall, and now, and now I'm challenging you, listener, to agree, disagree, work with me through that. Um, I, I'm thinking of myself when, when I read or when I perform, um, I'm, uh, yeah, I think I'm far more likely willing to want to um, be more ingratiating with an audience if that doesn't sound too, if that doesn't sound too craven. And so I think I might be, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'd be immediately leery and wary of putting myself out there in that sort of way. I mean, I can understand why, why people would want to claim it that way, but I, you know, but immediately my initial reaction is, hmm, actually, can I let the work try and badge me first before I badge myself? Does that, does that mm. sound sensible? It does, and I, I suppose we, it, it also shows a generational gap because I'm sure she had to do that. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, I mean, you know, all those terms, that was a radical act at that time. A lot of these terms are, you know, we, we've moved forward in terms of claiming that space. Um, so I suppose it's also showing a kind of a, a kind of generational gap. We don't have to make those decisions, you know. Will? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's it, isn't it? It feels like it's about choice, whether you have the choice over how you define yourself. Some people don't ever need to get to the point where they need to, they need to make that decision. I was actually just reading um, an anthology from the early 90s called Brother to Brother, edited by Essex Hemphill. And it's an anthology of <clears throat> US uh, black gay male poets. And it's, and it's incredible. It's, it's a mix of short stories and poetry. And there's a quote on the back, um, Audre Lorde wrote a blurb for it, where she says that self-definition is the core of power. Mm. And well, the, the flip of that is that those who don't have, is that those who don't have power are defined by others. And that's, I think, what the kind of like invisible elite don't see. There's a thing something Yi and Lee said, you know, invisibility is a luxury. We don't get the, the luxury of being invisible we're, you know, we're visible every time um, we stand up, it's like we're standing against a kind of white background. Our bodies are kind of are there, are particular. And therefore you have to make the choice. Am I going to let others look at me and tell me who I am? Or am I going to go out ahead of that and define myself? Um, uh, but I, I didn't always feel this way. I definitely felt, and that, that feels quite important to say in the discussion of identity, I definitely felt very uncomfortable about identity when I was younger. And I still feel a lot of kind of shame around that word. It almost feels like a kind of mantle, mm -hmm. like a kind of coat, which I don't want to wear because it isn't me yeah. in lots of ways, or well, at least, you know, identity with a capital Y, the identity that other people see, the public facing aspect of it. When I was younger, I just wanted to write. And I always thought that these different identities were kind of, prisms or lenses that were kind of, which were kind of dividing me and the reader or the subject matter. You know, I didn't want to write as a, as a man, as a Chinese, Indonesian, mixed race person. I mean, it's kind of complicated by the fact that I don't even know what I am because I have a very complicated ident her yeah. heritage. You know, I don't fit within a particular community exactly, but it's taken me a long time. And one, actually one thing that was helpful was Sarah Howe. I mean, there, were, there, weren't, there were no British East Asian poets when I was coming up until Sarah Howe, the first, but like basically the first one. I mean, there were in the past books that went out of print that, yeah, were kind of suppressed by the industry. But Sarah Howe and 
came up and I remember in one interview reading, she talked about how whatever she wrote, even when she wrote about like Flemish paintings, about capitalism, you know, whether she was writing race, race was writing her. Mm -hmm. And that was an important realization to me that I, could, I couldn't choose. Mm. Well, the race was writing me no matter what. The only thing I could choose was to take ownership of that fact, to recognize that self-definition was the core of power and choose how I define myself going forward, accepting the reality that I'm already defined, already marked, already racialized, already this kind of scarred object within the world. Mm. Um, uh, sorry, go <laughs> yeah, no, I was just thinking, I was intrigued by the title of the, of the discussion, A Decade of Identity Polit um, Poetry, um, as, 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 as if identity poetry is a genre. Um, and I, I found that quite interesting because I've never seen, I don't think either, all, any of us sitting here would see identity poetry as a genre, like contemporary, po like, you know, confessional poetry or or any of the other genres. Um, I think it's something that's there. And there have been very big discussions about identity politics um, and, and poetics, but I don't understand what a poetics of identity would look like in, especially in multicultural Britain, where there's so much voices and so much diversity and so much, such a tapestry. And, and I wonder who does that term identity poetry, um, benefit and how is it a decade when we had poets like Linton Quasey Johnson um, in the you know in the 70s and the 80s um, really talking about the you know and I'm naming Linton of that but a lot of other poets as well really starting to be in England and talk back to the establishment and talk about the injustices or talk uh, or write poetry like John Agard write very um, complicated poetry that, you know, complicated the English language and, and subverted the English language. So it, it was, it, it was interesting. It was up to me, it was like a, a very problematic title because I hadn't, to me, it, it just was a non-entity in a way. What do you feel? So, I mean, truthfully, yeah, when I looked at the title, I thought, well, yeah, I've never, I've never heard of this in terms of in terms of, you know, it's not like you'd walk into a shop and see, you know, identity poetry on a shelf and, you know, you know, as a demarcation or anything like that. Now, you know, having been thinking, you know, a lot about this, you know, one of the hats I wear is chairing Spread the Word, and we've recently published a report on rethinking diversity in publishing. So, you know, I can see, you know, a, a strand of thought being developed that, that tells a narrative around free verse reports, complete works, development of a cohort of 30 of us, you know, to greater or lesser extent, you know, worked with, worked on, packaged in such a way as to find new routes to market. And could you, because of our various different, our various backgrounds and heritages, say, are they are writing something that is loosely could be thought of as poetry of identity, perhaps. But you know, even in talking about it in that way, you know, it immediately obviously feels very crazily reductive, knowing knowing the wide variety in which the thirty of us write. Let alone, you know, everyone else who's come through, you know, without the benefit of complete works and and things like that. And yeah. yeah so, so I guess I guess let's let's park the sort of marketing shorthand, as it were, and actually get in a bit deeper into sort of what Will was hinting at in terms of actually, yeah, it comes back to power, and you know, and that sense of you know, not just who defines, but what you're def you're defined as, and and what are the almost the superstructures into which you are, which you can play you have to force your way to play you have to yeah you have to take as right you take as assumption while will was mm -hmm. will was answering that i was thinking a lot about the fact that you know yeah you know, when i answer questions around nationality you know yeah you know, i go to british first if there's the thing on the box i go for british asian asian british but of course even then those boxes have yeah, you know, variety in them. 
you know, Indian, you know, mm -hmm. Anglo Indian, whatever. Yeah, but yeah, and so even when you start to think about those, those, those ways of codifying and grouping are, you know, are myriad and shifting and not, and not tightly defined anyway. So, uh, yeah, so you're immediately into, into well, you know, we're trying to pin butterflies here, and that's mm -hmm. even before you start to think about how does class cut across. How does family background cut across? Mm -hmm. How does current living circumstance cut across? I'm very, very wary of always being held up, not that I am much, but um, held up as being an exemplar of any community for two reasons. One, I don't think I am particularly an exemplar of any community. And also part of the role of writer is to stand aside and stand at one remove from any community so one can observe. And so, yeah, there's always that tension that you are, that you are having to straddle and navigate mm. and that, yeah. And so, yeah, there's immediately, um, do I really want to be positioned as become a spokesperson? No, not really. I'm writing to find my own way through and find answers to questions that I am discovering. And if people draw from that, great, but yeah, be wary of taking that and making that any further. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the I connect to the, the exemplar thing. I remember I uh, thinking of I think one of the things, like I said, I found I found identity difficult when I was um, when I was young when I started writing my mid teens. I think partly because of the GCSE syllabus. Mm. It always felt like the way poets, non white poets were included, they were like the representative of a given community. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, there'd be like the Caribbean poet, the um, mm. like American poet, the black, the black poet, the, yeah, I mean, actually there wasn't a lot of diversity now I think about it, <laughs> but <laughs> even with that, there was, the way they were taught as well, they were linked to a story, a particular story of, you know, of, of oppression, usually, mm. and I guess I partly didn't know what my story was because it's quite complicated. The Chinese are a particularly oppressed minority historically in Indonesia, even though they're also relatively privileged um, socioeconomically. But anyway, but I grew up here. And also I didn't want to be a representative and there were no other. And so it was only later actually when I looked at the US and the US is like, I don't know, maybe it's more complicated than this, but it's always felt like it's kind of decades ahead of us. Mm -hmm. but, you know, if you're a poet of color, if you're an Asian American poet, there are, there are, there are loads of you. <laughs> you know, there are hundreds, of, you, don't, you don't have to write in a particular way. You don't, you don't have the burden of representing the community. You know, when I started reading them, I would read, um, you know, I could read Lee, Lee Young Lee, I could read Mamie Bersenbrigger, Marilyn Chin, Brenda Shaughnessy, um, mm -hmm. writers writing in, a, you know, a hundred different ways, and then obviously you could read Mother of Field as well, in, like reading internationally. But yeah, that was a big thing. Was here in British culture, there's a, there was a particular parochialism which felt like, and you talk about Linton Quaid Johnson. I mean, it felt like a few people could come up, but then they'd be actually spokespeople, and that didn't feel like I don't know. Maybe this is with hindsight now, you know. But then, where was the change that came from that? A lot of those presses, which public, you know, that started up in the eighties, the more radical presses, particularly publishing um, women poets like Sheba, um, they disappeared. You know, they all of, like Virago stopped publishing poetry. Yeah. Do Virago stop publishing yeah. poetry? Yeah. Yeah. Women's press, yeah, yeah, completely yeah. 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 disappeared. Um, I, I, I wondered uh, to take the, the the conversation on. I wondered if. Um, as we've established that that's, that's, I suppose in a way we are, we are, we are poets of color from different backgrounds, from different um, ethnicities and everything like that. Um, and I wondered if this was a really interesting time for kind of, because for the first time, whiteness is being questioned. I think all these questions that we have to ask, we ask against a kind of white, whitewash that that feels that in order to explain in order to include in order to understand it needs to label and it and the poetry that 
we write cannot just be poetry. It has to be linked to something else. But now, I suppose, in a way, with a political, with a turbulent political um, situation, which, which is coming across worldwide, coming out of the pandemic and also ignited by, um, by George Foreman's death, um, we're seeing the establishment really being questioned. We're seeing people for the first time being questioned in the way, I mean, this question that we've got on this panel is, 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 you know, is food for cause for, for people like us. This is, this is, this is what we're asked, but we're seeing people questioned about their histories, mm -hmm. their monuments, their things that all our writing most probably have dealt with and talked about, but they are being held account and being and looking um, culpable in colonial kind of um, kind of uh, uh, narratives. Um, do you think it's, 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 it's a very interesting moment. Um, do you think, what do you think about all that? What do you think about having, having people think about whiteness, colonialism, history, some of the ways that I suppose we have had to write because we've had to grapple with history because we've been erased. As you were saying, I'm trying to find myself. I'm trying to figure out who I am. Um, do you think that it's interesting in, that these dialogues are coming up and they might shift and change anything? I think thinking about the history is great. Um, and thinking about, you know, symbolic markers of that, the, the kind of symbolic residue of that accreted power has, has value. But I come back to um, uh, Mumtaz Ameri. Uh, she wrote this amazing piece recently in The, in the Guardian. Did you, did you read it about? No. About, it's about like privilege discourse, you know, check, checking your privilege. And, and I think that is the thing <laughs> be wary of you know when and which just kind of came up when everyone was posting those black squares on instagram you know that there's a danger that these are kind of and, and all these kind of all these brands were like saying you know hashtag blm you know we, we stand with BLM. like what does it mean if it's just a kind of surface gesture mm -hmm. or like even just saying i acknowledge that you know it's centering you know as a white you know it's centering you centering your kind of gesture of abasement. And that's not change. That doesn't do anything in itself. Mm. And it also, it also, if anything, it feels like it just plays into like the white, the white like Protestant obsession with guilt and self abasement. You know, it's just like more grist to the mill. You know, like, yes, please give me reading lists. Please give me ways to feel bad about myself. You know, but actually like challenging uh, the, the kind of, the, the basis of that power, you know, the property, the, sy the systemic inequalities, uh, that, that's, that feels like a different, a different thing. And, and, to, uh, and to take that on, um, you know, reading Montage's piece, um, you know, if, I think, you know, viewers of this panel will know that I'm a very reductive sort of thinker. And, yeah, my big takeaway from her piece was actually, this is the thing that people actually have to start to grapple with that is there i mean i pose it as a question is there a fundamental thing in the way in the design of capitalist system that implies that there has to be a systematizing of inequality for the system to work and has that historically that that systemization primarily be done through racializing yeah and you know and i I don't pose those in those ways to be provocative. I try to be neutral, and mm -hmm. but it's not you know, but it's not bug, it's system, you know, and inherent in the system since the system started to be developed and codified, five yeah. hundred. And yeah, that's a sort of meta level question that is when you pose it like that, it's almost impossible to grasp and conceptualize. Mm -hmm. But the more I think about it, the more I think it is the sort of question that poets poetry can start to at least illuminate and start to at least fill in some of those gaps that come from a very narrow conception of teaching what a what a wider global imperializing history is um and 
yeah and i think partly to tie back to what will was saying earlier in terms of say yeah the relative um backwardness in terms of senses of identity senses of community in say uk poetry as compared to us poetry again that ties to structure you know the idea of the hyphenated identity in the us is at least been present for a lot longer than it ever has been in britain and that's been again part of the design of what a notional british identity was or is you know the idea that in the bagging of the union jack everyone could come in theory from an imperial you know, from a from an imperial background but of course we know that through windrush we know that through earlier than that in terms of various race relations that that is a comforting myth that isn't actually true mm. and you know one of the journeys that i've been on over the last 10 years is that story that I've blithely said, yes, I'm British, I'm not English, because it, yeah, British yeah, is an identity that is cap capacious and welcoming, whereas Englishness is not. Actually, that story, as comforting as it is, is not quite as true as I wanted it to be, and as it might, yeah, might not be in terms of what's on the ground, in terms of legislation, in terms of institutional attitudes, and those, yeah, and those sorts of systems as well and so you know which is all a, a roundabout way of you know saying that you you yeah if we accept this idea of identity poetry then what you want to do is move it away from this idea of using individual personalized experiences to say this is us to actually almost actually use it to use that idea to say look at what we can show you about the world and the systems and the frameworks that you've created and then start to think about your position in relation to those mm. because yeah actually how that's fundamentally where you start to think about and unpack systems of power and don't take this to mean by the way that i'm some rabid anti-capitalist because clearly i'm not because of what i do and where i work yeah there are trade-offs here of course there are but we have to at least yeah we have to at least understand and know the system that we're in yeah and I, yeah and that is, yeah that's that's one of the big missing things for me i wanted to i i wanted to end really I, this is come to it's coming to an end too soon by talking about two specific pieces of your work because i think your work actually illustrates what you're saying you know saffron jack is 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 very much kind of anti everything it's it's kind of like it's it's a verse novel it's a verse kind of novel but it's anti verse novel it's um it's it's um it it's it's it, it's very it's a it's a narrative but it's it's done with it with with um with numer numericals one, 1 1.2 and bullet points 193 bullet points you know <laughs> um that's top and tail by a narrative so um I wonder if the, the language and that kind of that kind of radicalization of in, in your poetics is one of the ways that that you're kind of challenging the system. And then for Will, I was going to say um, I wanted us to um, I know it's always it's always customary to talk about the latest work by 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 the writer. But actually, I wanted to look at that essay that you wrote, um, because I think what I wanted to show is that I, I think in a way it's that the work that we're doing is is not is not really bleeding into identity politics, but it's a highly thought out, a highly critical poetic, um, e and even essays that we're doing that 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 is quite radical in its in its in its formation. And I wanted to look at your your essay, your personal essay, mixed race Superman, where you kind of ruminate on Barack Obama and um, Keanu Reeves and the mixed race inheritance. And you're kind of asking, what can they teach us about race and heroism? And I actually thought I wanted to end on your work because I wanted, I think in, in your work, actually in a way, if we end by talking about that, then you kind of see in a way how identity politics is quite reductive to the, to the, to the examples of what you're going to say right now before we end. So that's how I wanted to end. So if you want to speak briefly about Saffron Jack, and if you want to speak briefly about your essay, we'll, we'll most probably let the work do the, do the summing up, really. Is that okay? Um, yeah, absolutely. If I kick off, because, um, you know, 
very glibly, and I think you know, people in the audience who know me will also, so yeah, I, over the years I've often said, no, I'm, I don't really write about my identity. I don't, you know, I don't foreground it or I don't, you know, make a thing of it. And of course, you know, for those 10 years, I'm working on a big, long, you know, piece of narrative verse, which absolutely foregrounds it and absolutely tries to grapple with those things. Um, but for me, you know, part of, you know, and almost in a sense, okay, here is the identity work, quote unquote, now leave me alone to write about other things. So, you know, there's, um, there's that element. Of it. But part of what I was really interested in was, yes, my identity and Jack's identity, because, you know, as a persona, there's a bit of me in him, but it's not all me. Um, and but actually what happens when people don't fit and fit, yeah. and people fit in, in a country, in intellectual frameworks, in emotional frameworks, which tell themselves that people can and do fit? You know, and uh, yeah, so it's a way of actually thinking about, thinking about who is in, who is out, who belongs, why do they belong? How much do you have to acquiesce to belong? How much, you know, do you have to make yourself fit you know change yourself to fit how how welcoming how accepting are we of others yeah and the, yeah and and the book is trying to ask those questions now it does so in a almost a vehemently anti anti poetical way because that's the way that the character almost wants to wants to pose them and wants to yeah, uh, and wants to actually effectively throw that, you know, throw that spanner in the works of the way that the nation, you know, thinks of itself. And so, yeah, you know, a lot of the book is actually challenging those notions of Britishness more than, yeah, as much as they might be talking about, you know, my sense of how I belong in Britain and the extent to which that I do. Um, and, you know, and the form does that you know, in a quasi-legalistic way because this is it appears this is what we have reduced citizenship to and we have reduced ideas of citizenship to prove you are here prove you can be here in in a legal way yeah you know? and yeah you know, and for something that is a romantic invention because that's what nations are nations are, are you know in, in, in you know, a, an invention of the romantic period and also an invention of an idea of a romantic idea that you can reduce peoples down to you know a sense of coherent grouping it's it strikes me as just a really weird fundamental disconnect between you know okay we've got this romantic idea but then we have to legalistically make it operational and in that gap we can exclude and we can exclude even if even if the nation yeah you know, or the idea of the nation was halfway around the world controlling where you happen to be born and so in theory you are part of that nation as well so yeah these are attempts to try and you know not answer but you know but reveal and show and show show the gaps in thinking that there are or at least question the assumptions that lots of people won't have won't have to have won't have to think about you know let me be blunt white people won't have to think about their citizenship in the same way that we do yeah, and I think that, that, that fundamentally, I think what I suppose why I want you to explain about the work is to show that it's not a reductive, it's not, it's not even about identity. It's no. actually about, it's actually a poetic um, interrogation of, of, of the fabric of society, which is what, you know, which is to me, my favorite poet Blake does with Holy Thursday, where he's looking at, you know, how the pious are and how they're not. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And just to, just to add, it's also interrogating political philosophy. It's interrogating theories of the state. It's interrogating, it's interrogating at a practical level how you go about making a nation. You know, mm. large chunks of the large chunks of the of the narratives think about things like what do you actually need to be a nation? A flag, an anthem. What are the, what's the apparatus that actually yeah. makes you a nation? There, there's a very practical thing around what belonging actually means more than more than bigger buzzwords around you know sort of multiculturalism or whatever there are yeah, yeah. there are legal structures there are economic structures that make you into citizens make you into belonging and mm -hmm. those 
which can be designed to include as much as they exclude as well. And again, we don't think about those, at least explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and last thing I want to say in response before I move on to Will is that if you then have, re have publishers or reviewers who are just looking at the fact that, look, this is a writing by an Asian poet, it, it really does not take on the complexity of the work. It really does not take out on the, just the, 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 I suppose the witty, cynical viciousness of your writing. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, as a um, as sometime reviewer myself, I'm, you yeah, know, I'm aware of, you know, there are, there, you know, there are going to be certain places where there are reductions and there are, you know, and a, a, a necessary, you know, skinning over. That's, that's part of the system. But, yeah, but I would hope that I've written it in such a way that there are plenty of ways in for people. So yeah, interesting yeah. to me, a lot of people have gone in at the Kipling angle and use yeah. that to actually get their foothold in and say, ah, you're having a pop at Kipling, you know, or you're, you're clearly anti-imperialist because you're having a pop at Kipling or whatever. And, yeah, okay, fine, that's an angle. Yeah, Kipling's a hook. Yeah, but there's a lot more that's, yeah, that's going in there. And, yeah, and hopefully you see that through, through what this character is doing and where this character has placed itself, it's actually far more around picking at the idea and um, you know, trying to you know, unpick the understanding that Britain has of itself mm. rather than just mm. specifically going from here is one British Asian writer, you know, because, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, that, you know, in more skilled writers' hands, I'm sure that would be brilliant. That's not really the work that I can do. Yeah. What I can do is something that is, you know, is this weird, weird mix of playful and structural and, you know, and odd and challenging and whatever else it might be. I've talked far too much. Okay. Will, because, um, yeah, I just had this fantastic idea of ending on the work. So, Will, yes, uh, let's hear about this essay and... I was just like, how, how did you, were you dreaming and you went Keanu Reeves and Obama, <laughs> superheroes, um, anti-heroes, how, how did this work? Um, and I suppose in a way, I want you both to talk about your work to, to just show the complexity of thought. You're very sophisticated um, thinkers as well. So yes, Will. Uh, I think I just had like three coffees and I got an email and, had, and just replied really quickly. <laughs> and it was a new, a new press and they were looking for pictures uh, for this essay series and so I just sent like eight ideas and that was the one they responded to. Because <laughs> I'd been thinking about writing this longer book about mixed, mixed race identities and mixed race characters in, lit in film and TV and literature. But it was like way too big. It was like one of those things I would never have done because I just wouldn't. <laughs> Whereas I, I just like plucked two, two characters, I guess, or people, um, I guess there were also people out of my head and they seemed appropriate because they were so inappropriate. And it seems weird to me that so many people have been, have asked me about it. Like when I did for the US version of it, I had to write a whole new section just to find why I'd written about Keanu Reeves and compared him to Barack Obama because the uh, editor there, no, in a really nice way was like, I think people might be a little bit like weirded out by you comparing uh, an actor to a politician and like the actor's roles to the... I find out, I'm not weirded out, but I, 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 I really want to understand the mind. I don't, I, I, I more don't want the explanation of why you did it, but more the mindset of how, how you, you know that in the essay you have these disparate things, these angles and then they come together and something holds it. And I suppose I'm interested in interrogating the mind of that as opposed to the reasoning of, of or, 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 or what they helped you to explore, um, what they helped you to, to articulate, because I think that's what, yeah. that's why you grabbed them, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you want to make an interesting point, you don't pick two things which are similar, you pick two things which are really different, and then you think about the ways in which they could be seen as similar. Um, you know, you don't compare like the moon to a, a white orb, 
you compare it to like something weird. I don't know, something which doesn't look like the moon at all. Like a... Panda. You a panda. You a panda. Yeah, a panda. Yeah. Anyway, that's, a, that's kind of a digression. But that was the kind of starting point, the tension between them. And I guess, for me, they represented, like, obviously different ways of being male, masculine, and heroic, in inverted commas. So for Obama, his mixed race heritage was part of his, like, the story of his ascent to like, the presidency. It was a big part of his campaign message, this idea that he kind of unified the, the, the kind of irreconcilable parts of US history, you know, the dream of an ever more perfect society is enshrined in the constitution and also the legacy of slavery and reconstruction and redlining and all of that, that he represented the, those two in himself and therefore represented a way of overcoming it. That, you know, that like deeply problematic idea, which is in a lot of um, like often like, um, like optimistic utopian writing about mixed raceness where, or as just represented by my mom, who would often say, I had the best of both worlds, which is obviously not, not, not true because that's not possible. You, because you can't occupy two worlds simultaneously. And whereas Keanu Reeves was someone who who passed as white, who who could kind of like slide through the like barriers of racialization, but also who refused to really talk about race. And so he was interesting to me in that way, and also refused to talk about a lot of things like um, his sexuality in the nineties. He a, lo a lot of people thought even assumed that he was gay and he refused to either confirm or deny that. Right. And, and so he, he was kind of an interesting guy to me, whereas um, Obama is very like masked. And yeah, so it kind of, they provided two poles to think through what it was to me. And I guess actually maybe a, another useful starting point for the essay and useful for this discussion is like I was reading uh, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto and she has this great line about how one is too few and two is too many. My. And that has always seemed very powerfully true about the lived experience of identity. Mm. You, know? yeah. you, yeah. can't, you can't be, you know, one is never enough. But two is also, you know, you can't be, you can't be two things at the same time, really. You can't live the experience of being two things. I mean, I know that. Like, I can't, I mean, I, have, I feel like I have a lot of privileges, but I can't live as a white person and as a Chinese Indonesian person or just someone who on the street looks Chinese or Japanese or whatever. Um, and that's the kind of contradiction at the heart of identity that has to be thought through and has to be written through mm. by poets. And that's mm. why I've come back, maybe at the end of this discussion, to a defense of identity poetry, that so long as systemic inequalities exist, there will be a need for people to write from identity to, to define themselves, less power to find them. Mm. And, and I think the, the build on that is to say, is to say what in claiming that and claiming that space we must also claim the the right to multiplicities within that as well yeah. yeah because otherwise you know otherwise the danger of reduction the danger of a flattening you know and so sorry Ron. No, no no just building on that and also building on the point um you made like about uh, reviews and reviewing culture. Just uh, the other week, uh, there was a review of Nina Minga, Minga Powell's new book, Magnolia, and it mentioned me in passing, and also I think uh, a Singaporean poet called Theophilus Quek as part of this wave of Anglo-Asian poetry. Oh yeah, also misnamed, I, they also refer to me as Sam Harris, which was deeply insulting. But, it's much but, better than Dan. Dan, I started off referring to Dan. Dan Harris. No, it's true, it's, just like a very, it's a really boring name to be fair. <laughs> and in a way, that didn't, 
I neither of it. I, it didn't. Neither thing really offended me. But the whole ang the Anglo Asian thing really stuck with. I, I've never described myself as Anglo Asian, and it made me think. I mean, there is a lot of um, diversity within the you know whatever you want to call it, East Asian, Southeast Asian, British mm -hmm. diaspora poetry scene. But everyone is writing from a different perspective. Yes. You know, when I think of all the writers there. Jennifer Lee Sai, Mary Jean Chan, Jennifer Wong, Karani Baraka, Rom Ante, JJ Ying, Sean Wai Kyung, Leela Matsumoto, you know, that's just like to name a few. And they all have a very particular perspective. And I think it's really important that particularity is the basis of solidarity, that it yes. doesn't raise it. Yes. Um, and that that's why it's so important to fight against that language and to assert a particular form of identity, which isn't a leveling identity, which actually just destroys our poetry which is yeah. a way of, which is what how the white gaze operate it operates yeah. annihilates yeah. yeah 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 and I, yeah and i think it's a i a more a, yeah almost a more positive way of thinking about that is it is encouraging curiosity I mean, in the sense of yeah yeah we do not think it odd that we know about different dialects different ways of thinking about different regions of britain you know, we do not think of, you know, we, we, you know, we appreciate the fact that, you know, people in Yorkshire speak in, you know, have a different dialect to people in Lancashire, to, you know, how, you know, an Essex accent might sound, mm -hmm. you know, that parallel, it is therefore not surprising that within Asia, you know, Brit British South Asian communities, there is that sort of variety as well, that there is that sort of variety within British African communities, within British Caribbean communities as well. Yeah, but again, where does that curiosity about that further depth come from? Well, it comes fundamentally from understanding how yeah. much of the Britain controlled, how much of yeah our presence here is part of that inheritance. I mean, as Will was talking, I was me, I was thinking about the fact that I would never say I'm British Indian because yeah, yeah my connection to India as a country is what that my mum and dad came from that country you know 50 60 years ago but you know i was not born there yeah you know, i am a british citizen and you know attempts to hyphenate me okay fine acknowledge something of me but they also take away from the fact that i am british and like are you going to take away the fact that i am british or d diminish think... or, or d dilute that you know and it is for the wider wider um conversation it's for the wider you know wider populace to actually understand and appreciate the fact that their ideas about britishness are the things that have to change and they're yes. the ones that have to get deeper and more and more nuanced about what this capacious sort of baggy nationality actually is and means and what that inheritance truly is rather than saying okay we're going to yeah, we, yeah, we're going to be interested so far and then we stop being interested. I think that's a good place to stop. And I think it's really interesting because, oh, sorry, go on, Will. I end by asking you a question. About, because I, I feel like it would be important to bring in your perspective. I want, and I want to know, because also, you know, I, 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 I don't want to compare. You, you've had, a, you've had a, like a, long, a longer career than, than I have. And I wonder how, how it's worked for you, how, in particular, I'm interested in categorization, I guess. Right. That's what you made me think. How categorizing can be a way of not understanding, just kind of putting someone in a box, of like a little safe place and being like, okay, that's you, well done, pat on the, pat on the back. I don't know, how has that worked for you? Or have you, how, yeah, over your I career? Think I, I think it took me, I had to come to a place where I realized I had to define myself and that in a way that being the kind of writer I am would involve shape shifting around these different labels and identities that I put on myself and that other people put on me. But I think there was a point in, 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 in the nineties and in, in the early, in, in the early to mid two thousands where, um, and, and, and people like Lem Sisse, Roger Robinson, and a lot of us will agree with this, where the term performance poet, um, um, and I'm, 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 I'm excited to see people claiming performance poet and claiming spoken word artists as something that's very, um, in and, and that, 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 that's in the career part, but that was kind of like a derogatory term 
it was a term used by the establishment to shut us out, to say we can't publish these poets. They make it up in their heads. They don't understand poetics. They're not doing anything for poetics. And that, that and the, I, the, the need to kind of develop poetics kind of led to the formation of Malaika's Poetry Kitchen, a space where we could really, we, with like-minded people sit down and look at poetics and actually learn and talk about our craft because nobody really were taking us seriously and felt that the work was crafted. Um, so I, for myself, I see myself as a, as a, as a, as a, a, um, a British Caribbean poet. And I see my, my identity too is as, as, as the kind of Caribbean diaspora um, and react to kind of identity where, um, and, and I've, I've had to adapt in terms of plantocracy in, in, the, in the plantations as well, I think, in terms of always shape-shifting, of adapting different things, you know, you're a, you know, you're a black woman one day, you're a mother one day, you're a this, the other. And I think, um, I suppose in a way, that's why I think, think I like Audre Lorde, because um, at, at that point, she was claiming these really, all of them were radical um, labels in themselves that were, were kind of erased or were not existing, you know, women's role in, in, in the black community in the black Panthers in black movements at that time, being a lesbian at that time and all the roles she was were claiming as kind of um, as af affirmations as positive roles. And I think, yeah, I just kind of, yeah, just came up with the fact that I, sh I can shape shift all of this and, 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 and the, the work is the, the powerful thing and I need to I, it just get in the work to the best that it can be because that's what I do. That the work, the, you know, the, I want to be, you know, I want the work to be better and out of this work because I create this work and I create this work. Um, there's a manifesto in creating my work. I create this work writing for and about, you know, Caribbean women, um, and women as the um, very women centered kind of art form, but also it, 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 it goes across different things because like you guys, I'm interrogating patriarchy. I'm interrogating so much different things. I'm interrogating the, 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 the what, what, what we carry in our DNA from living and being on, on the, on the soil where we were, where, which is plantation soil, but has become a Caribbean, but it was maybe of several plantations. What, what is still there? What does the earth carry? How do we carry those things into the diaspora? So I'm dealing with that. So sometimes I'm, I say I'm a diaspora, you know, writer sometimes I say I'm a Caribbean writer sometimes I say I'm a black British writer and I I have the right to claim all of those mm. I feel Maybe. yeah um yeah so thank you thank you that was I mean that was I, did, I didn't know how this would go but this was a great great kind of conversation interestingly it came full circle to <laughs> to actually claiming ourselves um and I think the thing that we came up with that was that the notion of our identity poetry is, is is reductive and it's not something that we would put us put as a genre. As people who most probably that label is put upon, I'm sure that through talking about our work and talking, we've shown that that our work is much more complex than that. You know. So yeah, thank you. It's been good talking to both yeah, of you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Thanks, Malika. Have a sheet. <laughs> yeah, cheers, Will. Cheers, Malika. Right, we should let the good people of Berlin go, shouldn't we? Let them yeah. Go All right, thanks everyone. See you soon.